had, uh, had a question uh, with regard uh, to um, the Apostle Paul and just just a clarification uh, with with regard to some things that I said with regard to the Apostle Paul being the first member of the body of Christ. No, no, I do I do want to address that, and and the way that I said it because there there was a reason. The Apostle Paul has to be the f- first member of the body of Christ. He was not the first member that whose soul went to heaven because he outlived them. But the being a member of the body of Christ begins with spirit baptism. And no one prior to, to Saul was baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And so therefore, he has to be the first member whose soul and body were sealed into the body of Christ. He was not, however, the first member of the body of Christ who went to heaven because he lived a long time afterward. Uh, So uh, that's why I I spoke it in that sense. Uh, Going to heaven is not the same as being uh, placed into the body. They are two two separate things. Uh, So those things are uh, distinct. Okay, Let's, let's go all the way back. Uh, hope I didn't go too fast for you doing that. It would have been a strobe light effect. And now that we're all spiritually psychedelic, we can proceed. Romans chapter 11. For those who were not here and, uh, and didn't get some of the, this background, I, I don't think that uh, it would be uh, misplaced to just simply bring you up to date as to where we are in this study. We're talking about the fact that in past dispensations and in future ages, people will have angels who will guard over them. But with regard to the dispensation of grace, we do not have guardian angels. And this came as a question from several of you who have friends, and and I do too, who are making a lot of this business that they have their own personal guardian angel, you know, and and they wear the angels and they call them by name and so, so forth. Um, But that is absolutely not true. We have someone by virtue of who we are that watches over us that is more powerful, more omniscient. In fact, he is omniscient because he's God. And that is the Holy Spirit. He is the one who guarantees our safekeeping into the body. So therefore, he has to watch over us in time. Now, we are working on several illustrations, and uh, illustration number one is just a little chart involving two phrases. One is found in Romans 11, 25. Middle part, blindness in part is happened to Israel until, and here's the phrase, the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now this particular phrase alludes to what we call enumeration. That is, God the Holy Spirit is counting the members of the body of Christ. Since there is a whole population in the third heaven that is going to be cast, uh, excuse me, the second heaven that is going to be cast out, God is going to repopulate that area with the body of Christ. Now, all of us are just citizens of that particular domain called the second heaven. So any member of the body of Christ is going to be a citizen, but there has to be so many. And so God, the Holy Spirit, according to the plan of God, is working on a specific number. All right, turn with me to Ephesians now, chapter 1. But just repopulating the second heaven is not God's plan. God plans for us to now rule over the second heaven. We will rule over the two-thirds of the angels who remain faithful but doubted, and we will take charge. However, we all know that God cannot justly give us a throne we do not deserve. So therefore, as members of the body of Christ, we're waiting for the fullness of the Gentiles. We are all heirs of God. But the second, this phrase, the fullness of Christ, has to do if we suffer with Jesus Christ, and that is maturity, maturation. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. God sent Christ at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named, and put, verse 22, all things under his feet. 
Now, those titles there, and that's exactly what they are, are the ranks of the angels. There are actually seven of them, one starting with Lucifer, the anointed cherub, and ending up with the rank and file angels. But we replace that. So therefore, some of us are just going to be mere citizens of that heavenly domain. But some of us are going to have a name. Some of us are going to have a dominion. Some of us are going to be might rulers. Some of us power rulers. And some having a principality or sitting on a vast quadrants of uh, space at that time. But it's it, according to how we are rewarded, our maturity. And note, last part of uh, verse number 22, gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, insert the word Christ there in brackets, that fills all in all. The fullness of Christ has to do with those Christians who mature enough not just to repopulate the second heaven, but to be seated with Christ in the heavenly places, ruling and reigning with him over the angels. Now, the physical body of Christ on earth, the one born of the Virgin Mary, the Jewish body is going to rule uh, only over the earth. He has no more power than, than just simply to rule over the earth. His second body, you and me, potentially, will repopulate the second heaven, and according to our spiritual maturity, we'll sit on a throne ruling over angels. Okay, point with regard to the Holy Spirit. This lets us know what the Holy Spirit's doing in this dispensation. Number one, the program of evangelism. Uh, this was an interesting thing with regard to our camp, and I was pleased at this. Uh, almost all of the young people expressed a desire to be soul winners to witness to their friends uh, around the, the campfire. There were references made to uh, hell being hot as that fire and uh, that uh, they wanted to see their friends saved. Well, that's the fullness of the Gentiles. That is numerically putting people into the body of Christ. That's what God is doing today. And these young people said, I want to be a part of that. So our evangelization, our ambassadorship, all of those things are part of this first phrase numerically um, building up the body. But the second part is what you're doing now. And that is the fullness of Christ has to do with spiritual maturity, the amount of doctrine you take in so that it absolutely saturates your human spirit and you'll be able to, to recall it to life. And uh, um, I, uh, I was reminded uh, uh, by uh, Debbie Harrington just a little bit ago that I had a conversation with one of the mis missionaries with regard to um, when Adam died, is death just simply separation from God or did actually the substance of spirit disintegrate in his person? He said no, and I say yes. And when he says no, I say, well, what does it mean to be born again? Uh, how can you be, have the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit? What does he renew if it is not a spiritual substance? And then again, what about the body? What happens to the body when it dies? Is the, the body just simply separated from God? Nonsense. It actually dies and disintegrates. So you have the two entities, one outward, one inward, that need to be born again and resurrected and glorified. Anyway, uh, uh, I, I really like this missionary, and I, I didn't talk mean. I just talked a little emphatically. And I looked around, and I thought the rapture happened because just as soon as we done, we're done talking, he zipped out of there. And I thought, man, I turned over to Debbie, and I said, do you think I offended him? <laughs> because he was, he was gone. I didn't know where he went. But um, anyway, um, he'll get over it, hopefully. All right, illustration number two. Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. Chapter two. Now we are brought face to face with one of the most difficult tasks the Holy Spirit has in this dispensation. The Apostle Paul is going to tell us that the mystery of iniquity is already working. It is working 
uh, especially in the area of internationalism. We're all coming together. It's working in the area of ecumenicalism, where despite doctrine, we're all going to love one another and get together religiously, they have one world religion, one world government. And then in the extreme environmentalist move, we want to have a world that was like the Garden of Eden. Well, we don't want to have Jesus Christ. Well, that philosophy is the mystery of iniquity. That's trying to exalt what the Bible calls the man of sin. And this force that is, that is working is held in abeyance by one person, and that's the Holy Spirit. Because the man of sin brings a program uh, to bear upon this earth called the mark of the beast. And wouldn't it be something if the man of sin could put his mark on one member of the body of Christ? See, the Holy Spirit puts his seal, and the man of sin is going to put his seal on a member of the body of Christ. Now, it won't happen, but... That's why in Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit groans. It's not that something is impossible for him, but that's a difficult task, even for God, where the world is, is, uh, is becoming dark and hardened toward uh, Jesus Christ and his gospel. And yet the, the Holy Spirit has to hold it at bay so that the body of Christ or the one new man is protected. This is called the mystery of Christ. Now, the mystery of Christ is that in this dispensation, uh, God, the Holy Spirit, is forming a second body of Christ. All right, verse number 1 of 2 Thessalonians 2. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him... Now, this in the second epistle is a reference back to the first epistle, where in chapter 4 he says, we'll be caught up together to be with the Lord. And so he's, he's giving them a, a frame of reference historically as to what's going to happen. Now, someone uh, told them that the day of, of Christ is at hand. Literally in the Greek, it's the day of the Lord. The tribulation is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. That day shall not come, except there come the departure first. Reference to verse 1, the rapture. And that man of sin be revealed. But it's got to, you've got to have the rapture first, simply because God is not going to allow the one new man to be present on the earth when the man of sin is revealed. So that there is no chance of getting his mark on any member of the body of Christ. But verse 6 says, And now ye know what withholds, that he, reference to the man of sin, might be revealed in his time. The mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets, it's rever uh, uh, reference back to you know what withholds. Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way, and then that wicked one be revealed. So, this gives us further insight then into what the Holy Spirit is doing. First of all, his power. It's in the neuter gender. His power is being referred to. He is the restrainer. He is keeping uh, Antichrist, his philosophy, from fully engulfing this planet. He is allowing people to be saved and to mature. But it's uh, uh, more and more people are having blackout of the soul, hardening of the heart, uh, emotional revolt of the soul. Uh, uh, more and more people are rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ on every hand. And so numerically, they're becoming fewer and fewer. As in every dispensation, there's only a remnant that's saved. But he is the one who is restraining that force to protect us. And then, of course, you have the masculine gender, he who now lets. The one allowing at arm's length is the Holy Spirit. He is the restrainer. And both his power and person are referred to here. Again, one so that the numerical and uh, maturation levels of the one new man might be met within the time period. And secondly, that the program of the man of sin might not be realized until the complete body of Christ is removed. Okay. Let's go here to 1 Corinthians. And illustration number three. Now we're going to see that 
In keeping with this same concept, heirs of God, simply by faith, joint heirs with Christ if we suffer with him, fullness of the Gentiles, the numerical, uh, the fullness of Christ, the spiritually mature. Here the Apostle Paul is going to divide us up again into the body of Christ, of which we're all part if we're saved, and members in particular. Now that simply means that some members, though all are necessary in the, the body, some members are more important to the body. And I would just, um, uh, just illustrate this with uh, some of the internal organs. How many of you think you would last very long with an absolutely, totally dysfunctional liver? It's not going to happen. How about if they remove uh, your heart, cut out your heart, as some of the ancient barbarians uh, did, or some of the new um, karate guys who reach in and take your heart and show it to you before you, you die? You know, uh, you're not going to get along. Uh, you're not going to go very far without these organs. They're more important to the body. They rule the body. They direct the body. They give life to the body. Though all the members are necessary and important because the body of Christ will not be uh, amputated, it will not be ruptured, still there are some members in particular that are more important than other members. Our brain, for example, rules the whole body. Now, let's look at verse number 12. For as the body is one body, it has many members. And all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. I'm sorry. Here is the analogy to the human body. We have trillions upon trillions of cells in this body. Every single one of them is part of the body and is necessary for our life. However, when we look at it, uh, I don't uh, call you a trillion. Hey, look at the trillion. I say, there is a body. There is a person there. It is simply one, though comprised of many members. That's the point here. So also is the Christ in the Greek. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, and have all been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. So here we have the reference to the fact that each and every member is placed into the body of Christ. However, if you come back down to verse number 27, it says, and here's where you have the breakup. Now are ye the body of Christ, heirs of God, and members in particular, joint heirs with Christ if we suffer with him. We become placed by the Holy Spirit according to our maturity levels in the body of Christ as more important to the function and, and rulership of the, the body. These are the members in particular. Now, how do we know that? Verse number 18. But now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. That doesn't mean that he simply randomly places us into the body of Christ. Understanding where we will be with our spiritual maturity and in accordance with that level of his justice and righteousness, he places us in the body accordingly. Therefore, he is pleased with the composition of the body. He would not be pleased with it. It would be incompatible with his righteousness if he gave somebody with less spiritual maturity a greater uh, degree of importance in the body than, than someone, who, um, uh, as someone who didn't deserve it. He has to give your ranking, your position according to your spiritual maturity. So what is God the Holy Spirit doing? Again, in keeping with that first illustration, he is collectively counting the members of the body because all members are important. No one is not going to be included in the body of Christ if they're saved. However, in relation to our suffering with him, we are put in the body in particular, that is in a special place assigned according to our maturity. All right, let's move on. 
by the way, <laughs> this is this is still my way of review. <laughs> no one else is laughing, but that's okay. I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> Let's go to um, let's go to to um, Second Corinthians chapter one. You see, again, um, with regard to that, uh, in in repeating some of this in various times, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians with regard to that and talking about uh, it, it might seem redundant, he said to you, but there's a purpose in this. In other words, it's not what you hear and forget that's important. It is what you hear and remember. It's what you hear and cannot forget that is important. And that's why part of a teaching ministry is review. Some of it is repetition. Some of you is showing it again. Some of it is building precept upon precept. Here we've got the foundation. We go to the next level and so forth. So that you get everything involved comprehensively, but it takes time. You just can't uh, come and then, and then not come for a while and come. Not, you have to, to be consistent. Okay. Let's note a couple of things with regard to God the Holy Spirit in illustration four. And this, uh, we'll do this and then we'll move on to the, to the next. Uh, of course, saving some for uh, tonight and finish this up. But the Holy Spirit seals us. Actually, he seals us in two different ways. First of all, he seals us in Christ. Now, this is why. We know that nobody before Paul and nobody after the rapture can be part of the body of Christ because his baptizing and sealing ministry only takes place in this dispensation. So that if we don't get enough members of the body of Christ or people do not reach spiritual maturity, then, uh, then God has failed and forfeits the angelic conflict. But we know he will not fail. The rapture takes place because the church is completed. But note, Verse number 21. Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us with God and has anointed us is God who has also sealed us and given us the earnest of his spirit. Actually, that verse tells us two things here. One is God the Holy Spirit places us in Christ and then God the Holy Spirit places himself in us. That's important one, because he is the guardian to make sure that the body of Christ is delivered complete, as we'll see. And secondly, he himself takes a personal interest in it. Why? Because, well, let's, uh, let's just go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 while we're here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse number 19. Why does God the Holy Spirit take such a personal interest in our bodies? It's because our bodies are his home. He's sealed himself together with us, and with the Lord Jesus Christ and our human spirit. But actually, that is just his headquarters. He wants to be home. That's the filling of the Holy Spirit. What, says verse 19, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you're not your own. Now the reference to God the Holy Spirit being in us is the reference of his sealing himself in our human spirit. He is only all the way in us when we are filled. Now that, that is important. But he is, as it were, you know, you, you heard the song years back, I'm on the outside looking in. Well, he's on the inside looking out. Uh, and as he's, uh, as he's peering through the window, here he is in this compartment of, of humanity, saved humanity. But what is he yearning for? Not to be here, but to be in our bodies. That's his home. That's where he wants to be. And that's why we emphasize the filling of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you know, we, all, we always refer to the homeless. Well, you know, if you're not filled with the Spirit, God the Holy Spirit is homeless. 
That is his temple. That is his home. That's where he wants to be. Verse 20. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, that's spirit filling, and in your spirit, that's saturation of doctrine, which are God's. And God the Holy Spirit takes personal interest in that. Why? Because the more doctrine you have here in your human spirit, the more he is able to better lead you to sustain spirituality so he can be in his home for a longer time. That's why he's interested, and that's why he's there. Okay, let's move on. Let's go to um, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and we have verse number 5. Now here is, a, here is a good basic doctrine. The word us in this verse is referring to the totality of the body of Christ. Note what it says. And hope makes not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the, by the Holy Ghost. Now, note what it is. The Holy Spirit is here because he has renewed our human spirit so that we now have spirit, which was what God is, and truth, which is what God loves. God is spirit and truth. You've got to worship him that way. And when you are born again, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. There is spirit and truth there. God loves that. Therefore, he now loves you in a very personal way. You're a member of his family. But it also says, we have this by the Holy Ghost, and note, which is given unto us. Here you have uh, a part of grammar which tells us it's given to all of us for the duration. So that no matter where you are, what generation of the dispensation of grace, if you are saved, the same Holy Spirit that entered into Paul at, on the road to Damascus at first is the same one who is now given to us and will be given to anyone in the future who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that guarantees that we will all be placed together correctly in the body. The Holy Spirit is given to us, all of us, for the duration. All right, now let's look at just a couple more verses um, with regard to this, and then uh, we'll go to our springboard for tonight. Chapter 4 of Ephesians. <clears throat> and verse number 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Okay? We have seen all of these verses with regard to him putting people in the body and then, and then him maturing certain people as they grow in grace through their volitional expression. And, uh, and that this is what he is doing. Okay? He takes a special interest because he takes residency in our human spirit, but he wants doctrine there because that's the fuel for our spiritual life. He, through this doctrine, can translate that into him being where he wants to be in our bodies. The more doctrine we have, the more potential for the sustaining the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, why does Paul say, don't grieve him? Grieving is is an express attack against his person. Now we all want friends, we all enjoy fellowship, but the main person we should fellowship with is God the Holy Spirit. If we're not filled with the Spirit, we are rejecting his person in fellowship. Hey, look, I'm saved, I'm not gonna go to hell, I'm not gonna burn there forever in the lake of fire, but uh, hey, I, uh, I like my rowdy friends. I like my partying. I, I, I don't want, you know, I don't want to be part of, of having you for my mentor and guide and uh, uh, enabler in life. And so therefore we hurt him as it were. Now uh, you have to understand that that is an anthro, um, 
homopathism and uh, it, the Holy Spirit doesn't have feelings as such, but he is enabling us through this frame of reference to understand what we're doing to the Holy Spirit. He wants to be here in fellowship with us and our, and our bodies and we say no, so he's grieving. But remember, he is the one who guarantees that we're gonna be taken up in the rapture. <laughs> you, you better be careful. Now, now he, will, he will never deny you access but just please remember, he's the one in you. And if you're looking to go up in the rapture, he is the person to see. He's got the ticket. If you want your soul and spirit to be there when, when Jesus Christ descends from heaven with a shout, you better remember the person of the Holy Spirit because he's the one who is the guarantee of your being there. And then secondly, if the Holy, if you're not filled with the spirit, when you get there, what aren't you going to have? rewards. Now, I'm sure that God is going to call upon all of us to witness this and, and witness that uh, this person didn't do this. Oh, yes, this and yeah, admit this. We all have got to give account of ourselves to the Lord. And if we think we're going to sneak by just a little white lie so we can get a little bigger diamond in our crown, you've got to remember something, that there is a witness that is with us everywhere we go, our every waking moment. Who is that? The Holy Spirit. So that when we are caught up together and give account of ourselves, if you think you're gonna sneak by a little white lie, the Holy Spirit's gonna say, excuse me, uh, point of order, uh, Mr. Chairman, could I please speak, and so forth. And then he's gonna tell the truth about what we really thought, about what our real true motivations were, where we really were and what we did. Because he is given to us uh, to witness in that fashion. That's why Paul says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. And again, the last part of the verse, he is the one who seals us to the day of redemption. Point. In every member of the body of Christ, God the Holy Spirit keeps count. He knows your genetic code. He is the one who is going to bring the body out and make it part of this overall group known as the body of Christ. Okay. Now we're going to go to the last illustration with regard to the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 8. We just have a few moments. In illustration 2, we saw that the Holy Spirit has a tough job. He has got to keep the church in the world without having the mark of the world placed on the church in order to complete overall the body. But that is all external to us. In illustration five, we're going to look at something that is internal to us. It says, verse 18, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. In other words, all of creation is looking to believers, and especially the first believers who are going to be transformed and glorified, the body of Christ. They're, it's all looking to us and the, these times of resurrection. All right? Because, verse 21, the creature itself also, in like manner, is going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Now that's the phrase when we come back tonight, that's the phrase that we're going to build on. What does God the Holy Spirit have to do that's so tough? He has to allow, in four instances, the bodies that he loves, his house, to suffer disintegration and sometimes a higher intensity of pain um, and yet at one of the same time, protect that body, guaranteeing its safe delivery to the rapture, and at, at the same time, preserve our salvation. Now, if you don't think that is a tough job, restraining the man of sin and his philosophy is easy compared to this task. You know why? Because every single one of us has a volition, and oft times we act against our own best spiritual interests. 
Thus, we grieve the Holy Spirit who has to, who has to allow us to disintegrate, allow us to suffer the pain of discipline, and yet at one at the same time love our bodies and preserve us until the point of salvation, uh, total deliverance at the rapture. 